Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Leonard Steinhorn, professor at American University, a former CBS News political analyst on radio. And I'm here to moderate a conversation about something very important going on in our country, which is what's happening in the House of Representatives. Um, ever since uh, Kevin McCarthy was ousted last week, um, uh, the House has been pretty much in freeze frame uh, with uh, uncertainty and disarray and uh, an, an inability to get our nation's business done, which pretty much has been at a standstill even amid international crises and domestic needs. Um, it's not clear whether the Republican conference will elect somebody this week. Um, that's been ongoing. Those conversations were starting last night, plus during the entire week that everyone was away. There are reports of uh, division, bitterness, recrimination, uh, but also a desire to somehow unify the conference uh, and get the nation's business done. But we need a speaker. So what we have here today are three uh, former members of Congress um, uh, who are very familiar with the Republican Party. They are all Republicans. Usually we have bipartisan uh, panels uh, at FMC, but in this particular case, we need insight into the workings of the Republican Conference and the state of the Republican Party. And all three offer just insightful and uh, intelligent perspectives. Um, here we have Barbara Comstock, who is a board member of FMC uh, and the incoming president um, uh, of the former members of Congress Association. She represented Virginia from 2015 to 2019. Uh, and before that, she served in the Virginia House of Delegates. Um, She's seen almost everything in Washington, D.C. And, and in politics. She's worked at the Justice Department as a congressional staffer for presidential campaigns, and she frequently comments on CNN and other outlets. Charles Bustani is a board member and past president of FMC. Uh, he represented Louisiana in the House of Representatives from 2005 to 2017, served on the Ways and Means Committees, and was chair of the subcommittees on tax policy, oversight, and human resources. Uh, before Congress, uh, he was a cardiovascular surgeon and given the state of Congress these days, perhaps what it needs is a medical diagnosis. Um, Dave Trott uh, is a sustaining member of FMC uh, who represented Michigan from 2015 to 2019. He served on the Financial Services, Foreign Affairs, and Judiciary Committees. He's an attorney with lots of interests, among them real estate, sports, and entertainment. Personally, I had the privilege of interviewing him for FMC's 2021 Congress to Crossroads publication, for which he added valuable insights into the workings of Congress and also its shortcomings. So let us begin. We're first half, we're going to have a conversation, uh, and then we're going to open it up to a question. So please feel free to post, post questions in the chat if there's an angle or perspective you'd like to be discussed. Also, let me note that we will be on the record. Um, uh, so let's begin, uh, because there's no better way uh, to understand Congress than to gain the insight of people who have been there. Um, question one, and obviously top of mind for everybody, um, uh, will there be a Speaker of the House this week? Will it be Jim Jordan, Steve Scalise, or even Kevin McCarthy, who is keeping the door open, or someone we haven't even mentioned here? So, uh, Barbara, you want to kick this off? Wow. Well, it certainly uh, was a tumultuous week last week, and then the weekend brought even more uh, sobering uh, news. So uh, last night's meeting where you had um, uh, you know, all the Republican members go into a meeting last night to talk about you know, where they were on things uh, was not encouraging because they really did not seem to have a sense of urgency. They uh, kind of came out saying, no, may not, we may not get somebody this week. We're, we're not really near, um, you, you, nobody seems to have the votes. Um, they're not near closure. They're still talking about whether they're going to change the rules on that motion to vacate. Um, and yes, indeed, there were, I think, three members that said they will vote for nobody but Kevin McCarthy. So there is that talk of uh, bringing Kevin McCarthy back. And despite the urgency of just the horrendous terrorism we're seeing in Israel, and certainly on the Senate side, you saw you know, a very powerful column from Mitch McConnell saying, you know, we needed, you know, immediacy there to, you know, put together a package 
for aid to Israel, Ukraine, and um, you know, increasing the defense budget, something that I think there's broad support, uh, bipartisan, you know, in the Senate, and really brought bipartisan support in the House. Yet there's this, you know, impasse with really some very unserious people that are a minority of the Republican caucus, but though they are, you know, holding up things. So once again, we are at an impasse with these, you know, not serious people who want to hold things up. So it is troubling. And what will break that impasse? I don't know. You would have thought something like this weekend, given so many of these members have been to Israel. Um, they have seen these things up close. You would have thought that urgency would have maybe, you know, even with some of these eight, but it doesn't seem that it's done it has done that which is very very discouraging so charles these unserious people that barbara uh, mentions uh hold a balance of power right now um i mean what is the chance that you will get the serious people to be able to have a voice and to be able to elect somebody this week and will it be jim jordan or steve scalise or whomever well you know they just got back into town and Solving this cannot be done remotely. Uh, the members have to get back in town. They have to huddle. Groups have to get together, talk. Um, there's a lot of venting that has to go on. So I'm, I, I, you know, I'm not privy to what happened last night in the meeting, but having been in a lot of those over the course of time, um, I'm sure there was a lot of venting that was going on within the meeting and also afterwards. So I agree with Barbara. Things aren't going to get solved this week. Um, I don't think Scalise uh, or Jordan have the votes at this stage. And in, I think they're, they're they're both pretty far away from being able to consolidate that kind of support. So it's, it's still an open situation. What has really changed in the House over the years that brought us to this, um, obviously the partisanship, the division, the zero sum mentality, uh, which uh, manifests now within that small group that's been completely disruptive. Um, and this is a problem because the whole, th the whole place works on consensus and, and building consensus around legislation. And that's why you're seeing that kind of dysfunction. But let me just say that I think they're a long ways away. Uh, they're going to have to work through this week, vent, huddle, talk. Um, and even for the you know, for the, those of us who've been around for a while and watched this kind of thing, it's still a very uncertain game. Lastly, I would say we have now moved beyond the point where uh, a major emergency or a major foreign policy challenge will unify the, the House. They are focused solely on what they, you know, what they want. There's a sort of an inward dynamic there that um it's 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 kind of a being self-centered in other words everything revolves around the house and everything can wait and that is a very dangerous place to be right now so charles you're almost saying that the national and the public interests are you know being held in a standstill because of the internal dynamics of the house um and i remember dave when you and i talked a couple of years ago for the Congress of the Crossroads um, publication, um, you did have a lot of insights into the dysfunction of the House um, and what's wrong with it. So, the real issue right now is uh, how do how does the critical mass of the let's say the people that Barbara might call the serious ones, how do they actually come together and elect somebody? Is that possible <laughs> given the culture of the House right now? Uh, I don't think it is. Um, you know, I, I think uh, we need to elect someone uh, who's more moderate as speaker who can bring uh, bipartisan solutions to the floor. And that's not going to happen. And so I think looking forward, uh, the, the governance is going to continue to be challenged in the House, no matter who the speaker is. Uh, I think there's a chance that they will elect a speaker this week because, you know, in the last few days, the world has changed. The events in the Middle East are profound and, and significant. And I think there's tremendous pressure on the Republican conference to, to elect someone sooner than later. And so it's possible they could settle on a slate where Scalise is the speaker and Jordan is the majority leader. And maybe that's a, a resolution that gives people uh, 
uh, cover to save face. I think it's very unlikely that any of the eight people that voted to remove McCarthy will back down. Uh, that would look terrible for them and put McCarthy back in place. That's not going to happen. Or you could see the conference pivot and elect someone like Tom Cole, who's widely respected and, and great has great uh, you know uh, credibility in the House. But uh, unless they elect someone like Barbara, for example, as speaker, uh, the likelihood of, of the place becoming a high functioning body anytime soon is is remote at best. So do you think that there is a decent chance that there could be a, a Scalise Jordan team uh, coming together? And do you think that would be able to get those 217, 218 votes necessary? I, I think it could get the 217 votes, but I don't think that will necessarily result in in a in a you know better a better uh, high functioning group in the house because uh uh you know I, I was on a talk show last week Dave, dan abrams show and and uh and we had a caller call in and he, he said you know with everything that's going on why not burn the place down why not let gates burn the place down and destroy it and i i said well you know you're you make a good point there's a lot of bad things going on in our country our debt border crime inflation i i understand your your reason for being upset but but if you think matt gates is solution if he brings it to the House, they're going to all of a sudden say a majority of the House is going to say, gosh, Matt, I'm so happy you came forward with this great solution. And the Senate's going to embrace what Matt Gates is putting forward. It's not going to happen. We need bipartisan solutions that are more moderate, that can survive the test of time. Uh, and, and those solutions will bring us to a better place and solve our country's problems. Well, and here's th those eight people who held everything up. You know, they're always saying that their issue is the debt. Yet these are the same people who support Donald Trump, who is not about cutting anything. He's the person who's saying you can't cut Social Security, you can't cut Medicare, which are the largest parts of the budget. And, you know, and these guys also want to cut uh, the defense budget by quite a bit, which, of course, you know, now they're also saying we want to help Israel, which I do, too. So they are not at all realistic. And, of course, they supported Trump in running up the $8 trillion in defense. So they are, when I talk about them not being serious people, they are, they do not put forward any budget. You know, back in the days when Paul Ryan was trying to put forward, when he put forward an alternative budget, he had an actual budget. These people don't have any alternative budget. They just keep saying they want to do something different, but they don't have any real bills that they ever support. So given the sort of partisan bitterness in the House, do you think there is any chance to develop that sense of bipartisanship, which, Dave, you were mentioning, and and I think Barbara and Charles both agree needs to happen in an evenly divided country and a, more or less an evenly divided House, and especially given that you have a number of Republican rebels who don't want to work with any Democrats, uh, how do you build this sort of bipartisan problem solving that that we everyone seems to say we need. Well, I'd like to see the the moderate, you know, the moderates or even the governing wing for a change kind of hold the other guys hostage for a change, you know, because these guys who are always holding the party hostage are the guys with no solutions. Um, you know, they they don't have a plan, which is why we are now here with no speaker. You know, the guys who do have a plan say the people who want to, um, they want to have money for Israel, they want money for Ukraine, and they want to have a larger defense budget because we are in a very dangerous situation now. And they want to keep the government open, which in mid November, we will not have the government open if we don't come to a solution. If they say, hey, we're, we're going to take a walk if you don't do this, and we can walk over with the Democrats and deal with them and deal with the Senate if you guys don't want to play. And there's a guy named Hakeem Jeffries who might not mind working with us. And since we're in these districts, there's 18 of us, so it just takes maybe six of them, a third of them, to say, we're going to be goners if we have a Speaker Jordan. You know, if you're uh, those guys in New York and California, if it's Speaker Jordan, they're gone anyway. So they can say, we, we're going to go work with him because we're dead meat if we have you guys running the show anyway. So why don't we go over and work with them and, and we'll do it, you know, and you want to try us because we just we can walk out and do it. I just wish for once because I certainly know if we, we 
you know, it, because these guys are running them off a cliff. And, and more importantly, they are endangering the world now. I mean, how you can look, I mean, one of, one of the eight, and I won't name him because he's such an unserious person, but this is the person, you know, when he sees a shooting in his own state, in his own area, he just says, yeah, there's nothing we can do. Doesn't even offer, he just says, yeah, no, there's nothing we can do. Sees the Israel situation, no, nah, there's no urgency. No, nah, we're not gonna do anything different. Yeah, we're gonna take our time on speaker. You know, this is just not a serious person. It's not somebody who ever offers anything, but loves to go on TV every day of the week and talk about daggum this and that and, and think, you know, and this is just- well, Barbara, I, I think there's a, there's a tremendous opportunity now uh, to, to do this crossover with serious Republicans who want to govern working with Democrats. And I say that because in the past, the risk was, well, if you do this, you're not going to get reelected. Well, they're not going to get reelected anyway. No. Um, under because these Jordan get, can't raise money either. They just deposed Kevin right. McCarthy. They're not going to have any, the fundraising is being killed by Donald Trump too, by the way, who was dancing at a fundraiser last night like a fool you know, when these serious things are going on and talking about whales and lobsters, um, you know, so this is the state of the party. But but isn't there also some anger at the Democrats uh, for not sort of going and voting for Kevin McCarthy uh, at the last minute? I mean, obviously, the Democrats felt betrayed by the former speaker and uh, sense that he sort of tried to blame them for the government near government shutdown. This is, ours, but this is our civil war. This, this is, is your yeah. civil war. Yeah, okay. I, I agree. Dave, you, know, yeah. it, you know, the the, the the solution that Barbara laid out would work well. I think it's unlikely still that that will will play out just because people will be worried about the, the, the reelection chances. What we really need is a president who can can unite the country and really operate in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, certainly, Donald Trump has no ability to do that. Uh, Joe Biden, I think, is a centrist at heart, but he his party won't let him do it. But if we had a president that could put forward moderate solutions and and cobble together uh, coalitions that can pass things on a bipartisan fashion, that could be a game changer and could bring Congress along with him or her. Uh, you know, it's very interesting to see yesterday Robert Kennedy Jr. announced he's running as an independent. I mean, there may be some pieces in play in 24 and most certainly probably by 28 that will will redefine politics in our country and give the moderates and the independents more of a voice in how things are governed. But do you all think the moderates uh, in the Republican Party right now, given the urgency of all the issues we face, have the backbone, the will and the ability to say, you know, to basically be the ones to say we're going to seize power and we're going to be the ones to determine, uh, you know, how all of this works. I mean, for time after time, it's always seemed like there's been chatter about that, but they've always gone back, uh, you know, to the tribe, to the camp. Um, you know, do you think they have that willpower uh, to go along with Barbara's solution in the short term? Dave, yes or no? No. No. Charles? I don't see it happening. Uh, I wish it would. I, I wish that, you know, it's like if if you're going to if you're going to go down anyway, you might as well go down trying to save the country instead of just uh, going down with a with a team that's uh, hurting the country. But Lenny, Lenny, you hit on something a moment ago uh, when you raised Hakeem Jeffries and maintaining democratic discipline to say, no, we're not going to do a deal with you guys. Um, I mean, I understand why he did it, but this is a real opportunity for him to show some leadership and i think he needs to be prodded and he needs to he needs to think that there's an opportunity that's a positive for him to do this and the way to do that would be in my view if a core group of republican moderates who want to govern went to uh, uh, their counterparts democrats and said we want to do this let's formulate some ideas that we think have to be uh, dealt with legislatively now. Let's come up with a plan, and then you, you Democrats, go get your buy-in from your 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 leader. Let's put it down on paper and hold each other accountable. You don't have to make it public, but you know, sort of a contract between the two 
that's held in private, but they can each have a copy and they can hold each other accountable by threatening to release it or something uh, at a later time. Maybe that's an opportunity that creates a pathway, but Hakeem Jeffries is going to have to give his Democrats the opportunity. I tried this during the Obamacare debates. I tried to bring a, a group of centrist Republicans together with centrist Democrats. We had several meetings. We actually had, had one meeting with Steny Hoyer at the time, but the clock ran out on us, but we were making progress. And that's the, the approach I used. I think this could work, but it's going to take courage. It's going to take initiative. and But it also requires Hakeem Jeffries to put aside the zero sum, sum mentality. But you also need a speaker. Um, and let's say it's a speaker Scalise. Could that even happen with a speaker Scalise determining what goes to the floor or a speaker Jordan? Or, I mean, in other words, would the alternative, Charles, be, uh, you know, the, the moderates basically saying to Hakeem Jeffries, one of us will be willing to serve as speaker if you Democrats vote with us and we can have a critical mass of people in the House who want to govern. Is that fantasy? Is it a hope or is it even a dash of realism to that? Well, it's wide open. Um, and this is what leadership's about finding creative ways to get around an intractable problem. Um, and look, Scalise is a hardcore conservative every bit as much as Jordan. They just have different personalities. Uh, they're both pretty hard on the right. Um, I don't think either will ultimately be successful if they are indeed elected speaker. It will be short-lived. Um, the bottom line is, there's latitude for creative solutions here if 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 someone's willing to assume leadership and try to pull this thing off. What about the problem solvers? We've had a couple of questions from uh, uh, folks uh, about the problem solvers. You know, can they play any role, or is there enough bitterness now among Republican members toward the Democrats who didn't vote for Kevin McCarthy that the problem solvers uh, are not going to be uh, a factor here? Or is is there a role for them? Can they stitch together? again, what they had before uh, the ouster of Kevin McCarthy? Um, or is this something, as Barbara says, has to be done within the con confines of the Republican Party, which I think I quote you correctly, is in the midst of its own civil war? Well, I, I was in the Problem Solvers Caucus, uh, a great too. group of, <laughs> of moderates. And, and uh, I think it's uh, unlikely that, that uh, uh, Leader uh, Jeffries would give the moderate Democrats in the Problem Solvers Caucus permission to vote for a reasonable person for speaker who is a Republican absent the deal that Charles just described, which would need to be reduced in writing in terms of what what they're, how they're going to power share. So I think it's unlikely the Problem Solvers can solve the problem. Uh, it is a civil war. And, 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 and I think, it, you know, if I had to pick someone, I think Jordan has probably got the advantage right now. The knock against him is he hasn't raised $170 million like Steve Scalise has in terms of his fundraising. But if you look at the red meat issues for Republicans right now, Jordan is is on top of all those issues, impeachment, the border, crime. Uh, and, and that's what matters to most of the Republican members and back home. And so they're at the end of the day, it, it would be terrible, I think, to have a Speaker Jordan. But I think he's got the advantage over Scalise. I don't think he can get to 217, though. Yeah, but, but yeah, I don't see Jordan getting there because, I mean, the problem, I mean, Jordan is a legislator who's never passed a bill. Right. Um, he's a lawyer who never passed the bar. Um, he's somebody who doesn't have relationships across the caucus. Um, I, If he has a relationship with a Democrat, it's not one I'm aware of. Yeah. You know, you think of people who have relationships I guess he does have relationships with some of the extreme, maybe new right wing Senate members, but certainly doesn't have relationships with Senate leadership, certainly doesn't have any um, foreign relations experience, which became apparent over this past weekend. What troubles me about, you know, him, and I think you saw that vacuum when um, Kevin McCarthy went out and spoke yesterday about Israel. Um, you know, that clearly there wasn't somebody who was going to speak about that yesterday. You know, uh, Mitch McConnell went out and spoke clearly and, and then Kevin did. 
Uh, but the idea of Jordan being in that role, being one of the eight that was going to get brief, this just isn't his wheelhouse at all. Um, you know, not even with Israel. I mean, yes, he'll give a perfunctory statement, but he's not a person um, who's ever been in this uh, type of role. And it just is kind of frightening. But it also would make the party just all about Trump. This is just somebody who's hitched himself to a strong man, not his own person at all. I, I Trump, think Boehner, Trump, that's what he does. Yeah. So it's just, you know, at least Steve, you know, Steve has relationships separate and apart from Trump. He hasn't even endorsed Trump yet. Um, he does have relationships with Democrats. So personality wise, you know, Steve has passed bills. Steve works with members on passing their own bills. <laughs> you know, Steve has served on committees where he has, you know, been involved with legislation ha because he's been in leadership. He has relationships with, you know, the Senate leadership and, you know, has been on, you know, those trips to Israel and has that type of relationship. So there's at least an independence from the Trump world where that's not his whole essence and being. So the idea that we're just going to become a Yuda Trump existence, you know, where there's nothing but Trumpism, where it's sort of a monarchy now, just frightens me in terms of the party has never been one whole essence of a person. And that's what a Speaker Jordan would be in a way that we have never had as a party ever in our <laughs> history. Pr Professor, I think uh, John Boehner uh, described Jordan best when he called him a legislative terrorist. Well, so let's not pass legislation. So, <laughs> so let's I don't say think he never voted for a budget. Maybe he voted. I guess maybe he voted for one of these CRs that slashed funding down to nothing, but. Um, it's been rare that he's uh, ever been part of a solution. It's always been taking things down. And of course, as Liz Cheney pointed out, he was tied to the hip with Trump on January 6th, which is problematic when the guy has four indictments and is going to be in trials. So, you know, I don't think you need to have your person, you know, who's second in line from the president tied to that kind of scandal. So, but let's say Dave is correct. Aside from that. <laughs> Let, let's go. say Dave is correct that Jim Jordan may have a fairly good chance to emerge, uh, uh, to get all the votes. What does that say about, the, but, yeah. but what does that say about the Republican Party right now that a Jim Jordan, somebody that former Speaker Boehner had called a legislative terrorist, uh, 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 that he has an even a fighting chance to become a speaker or the majority leader of the Republican Party in the House. So let's take a temperature here of the Republican Party, what's going on in the party, and also let's look ahead and how does all of this infighting and sort of laying it all bare uh, influence uh, 2024 and whether the Republicans can keep the majority or what that might mean for the presidential election. So let's dive a little bit into the party itself and tell us what that means. Uh, and then we'll get back uh, to the actual speaker vote, because I'm very curious uh, about how long you all think this is going to take. But first, Republican Party, what's going on? I see people shaking their heads. I mean, well, it's, I think it's a death <laughs> wish. You know, it's been on a death wish since Trump came on the scene. You know, last year was, you know, a disaster really for the party. When it should have been a red wave, it was barely a ripple. And that's been the story, you know. And so instead of learning the lesson last year, they're doubling down. So I, I think it certainly would um, mean more of the same. I think you know, at some point, uh, the American public is going to become very, very uh, disillusioned and angry about the inability to govern. And we've seen this in the past where dysfunction, political dysfunction, uh, dysfunction of Washington actually actually polled higher than any other issue, including the economy at one point. Um, as these, these problems mount, uh, the inability of the Republican Party to govern, the lack of will to govern in a in a sound way is going to hurt the party. And it is, I believe, in a death spiral unless uh, that dynamic changes. And I think for 2024, the longer this chaos goes on, and even if they do elect uh, Jim Jordan or somebody like that, uh, a speaker, it, it's going to continue to be 
uh, a problem for their reelection pro uh, prospects in 2024. I think they could lose the House very easily. It will it will it will be a drag on the Senate, and certainly have an impact uh, potentially on the, the presidential election. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I think the party is is in a death spiral. Uh, it's because the, the undisputed leader of our party is Donald Trump, and he's an individual who's who's singularly unfit to be president of the United States, uh, emotionally, intellectually, morally, psychologically unfit. And so as long as we hitch our star to Trump, uh, uh, the party will never uh, re retain control of the House or elect anyone as president. Uh, probably, I, I should say, who knows what could happen in the presidential election with third party candidates. But, uh, you know, in Michigan, state of Michigan, for example, the party is in such bad shape, they don't they can't pay the rent on their headquarters. Uh, and the leader of the party is someone who lost by 14 points in the secretary of state's race and refuses to concede the election. So, uh, you know, that kind of mentality is not going to get us anywhere with the, uh, the 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 center, which decides the elections in places like Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. Uh, 10 or 20 percent of the moderates and independents decide the elections and they're never going to identify with Republicans with the current mindset. But let me um, play devil's advocate because I do this in classes all the time. Um, from the perspective of, let's say, the, the Gang of Eight or the MAGA Republicans or Donald Trump, the system needs to be upended. It's not addressing things like the border. Um, and it's failed to do so in a bipartisan way for many, many, many years. Um, it's not addressing uh, the national debt. From their perspective, government is too big and it needs to be reined in, um, that we need to deal with issues like crime and that we need to be able to uh, sort of reorient our economic priorities to address the needs of working class Americans. Um, so from their perspective, um, the system has not been working as is, and that all they're trying to do is to upend the system. And uh, as Donald Trump said in 2015 and 2016, is drain the swamp from the people who have an outsized say in our politics. So you know, is there any, you know, I mean, are they potentially tapping into a sentiment of frustration in the country um, that a lot of Republicans just aren't hearing, or are they political terrorists or nihilists uh, who shouldn't be taken seriously? I mean, they are they are not only tapping into it; they're fueling the anger and making it a lot worse. And they're going beyond disputes over issues, not, not even just legislation, but issues, broad issues. They're actually going after the constitutional foundations and the institutions that underpin our, our democracy. They are basically destroying the House of Representatives right now. Um, they would do it to the Senate if they could. And the problem is the, that is extremely dangerous. And it's triggered all kinds of problems within the Re Republican Party. Dave talked about Michigan and Louisiana. There's a, a even in Louisiana, which is hard right, there's a division between those who are really extreme hard right and those who are still unacceptably hard right. Um, and so when you're seeing that kind of, of uh, split going on within this party, the party itself is is basically not only destroying itself, it's, it's destroying the constitutional foundations of our country at the same time. Uh, what they've done in calling the courts, you know, the, the judicial system in the question, uh, the way they've stacked the courts in some instances, the way they've, they've, they've certainly undermined the House of Representatives as an institution, this is extremely dangerous. And it's worrisome, and I, I, I wish I had a better answer as but, to how to get out of this dilemma. But, well, and, and but, like, uh, like on the on the border, you certainly, you know, the whole the issue of you know working with Israel on Israel and Ukraine, the border, I think, is, is part of that deal too. I think Mitch McConnell and talking about that. So there are compromises to be had here, as well as you know cutting you know budgets on other things. It's just they won't compromise. And we haven't even talked, you know, when you're talking about the election denialism and, the, and all the things that they have wasted their time on and why they, when you look at last year's elections, 
the reason all those candidates who lost is they were looking back and not looking forward on solving the problems. They weren't talking about crime and, and the border and the things that you were supposed to be focusing on. They were all talking about Donald Trump's grievances in the 2020 election and not in bathrooms or whatever crazy things they were talking about. And they weren't in the misogyny that you have in the party. You know, we haven't even talked about things like that, that that just scare away, you know, the suburban women and young people who have just left the party in droves and independent voters. Um, you know, in, in my state of, you know, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, you just, you know, you do, you lose the suburban voters uh, because of, of that kind of thing. And to see somebody like, you know, Nancy Mace claiming, you know, she's the voice of women, and then she's hanging out with the likes of Steve Bannon, one of the biggest misogynists who's always attacking women, and Matt Gates, who goes out and attacks women for their weight or their looks or things like this. You know, you're going to hang out with two of the biggest misogynists and claim you're the woman who's representing women for Republicans. You know, I'm sorry, you cannot be taken as a serious person. We're a party that does have serious problems with women and the faces of uh, the party should not be Matt Gates and Steve Bannon, a uh, you know, who has some convictions that is going to be going to jail <laughs> soon. You know, that's not where we need to go for that. You know, Professor, hey. you know, I, I don't have any respect for the gang of eight and their cronies who are, at the end of the day, all of their antics are, are an effort to try and monetize off of our dysfunction. They're all raising money off of what is happening right now in Washington, which is disgraceful. Uh, but at the end of the day, also, we have only ourselves to blame. I mean, it's the, the people in Matt Gates's district who don't go vote in the primary to throw him out of office that are to blame. It's not Matt Gates. Matt Gates should be not, she, he shouldn't win the primary. And the moderates who are wanting to get things done shouldn't be worried about being primary for being productive. But to your question, if Matt Gates's ideas on the border or if Jim Jordan's ideas on the debt had any chance of coming to fruition, then I'd say, gosh, everything they're doing is worthwhile because they're trying to blow the place up to make progress on the debt or border or crime issues. But those two guys have zero chance of accomplishing anything on those important issues. Charles could get it done with Steny Hoyer. Barbara could get it done with uh, um, Akeem uh, Jeffries. Those two guys have zero chance of getting anything done on those issues. That's why the idea of blowing it up to accomplish something is, is disingenuous. So I'll ask one more devil's advocate question. They're just trying to run for question. higher office. They're just getting clicks. And, you know, Matt wants, Gates wants to run for governor, which he won't be governor. Well, I'm a and, Florida resident now, so maybe maybe I'll have something to say but, about that. Well, <laughs> devil's, another devil's advocate uh, question then, um, because, Charles, you spoke of uh, democracy and Barbara. Um, you spoke of election denialism. And, and Dave, you said that the eight really don't have any chance of getting anything done. But wasn't there a permission structure given when the majority of House Republicans voted not to accept the election of 2020, including former Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy? So were they giving mixed signals to the Republican conference, basically saying, hey, we're going to side with Donald Trump, most of us, including the incoming speaker. Um, and, and isn't it easy now to blame the gang of eight uh, and not to look at the culture of the party and say, how do you build that sense of governance that you want to be able to get things done? But that was a big difference between the House and the Senate. Mitch McConnell, John Thune. John Cornyn, Joni Ernst, all the leadership over in the Senate did not do that. You know, even Lindsey Graham said, count me out. I'm out. Right. Remember that speech. So you didn't see that over in the Senate. So it was a big mistake on the House and the House leadership to go that direction. You know, after the the insurrection and the riot on January 6th, there was a very easy opportunity that night to say no we're going to vote to certify this and stop this. And um, clearly that uh, has been a, a big problem for the House ever since. So let's talk more practically at this point. Um, question one, and this is, should be a quick one. Is there any chance, somebody was asking, that Donald Trump could potentially become Speaker of the House? No, rules do not allow uh, people who've been indicted 
uh, to be a speaker or people who are running for a higher office to be speaker to strikes against. <laughs> All right. Uh, next, how long do you think that this is going to take to resolve? They might be able to resolve it by the weekend at the soonest. Uh, weekend at the soonest. Uh -huh. Just keep them in a room and, to, and with food and not let them out. Yeah, right. I, I think they'll uh, be, there's a lot of pressure on them to resolve it uh, this week. Uh, and, and and I suspect they'll find some way of, of doing it by some uh, slate that, that maybe gives everyone a little bit of uh, ability to save face. And maybe they come up with a name or somebody, you know, like we were saying before, someone like a Tom Cole or a Steve Womack, who is the person you saw in the chair when they actually voted Kevin McCarthy out. He is one of the most effective guys in the chair um, who uh, is one is from the governing wing of the party. He's from Arkansas, He's very much a conservative, but he is, uh, you know, a serious legislator. It would be nice to see somebody like a Tom Cole or a Steve Womack. I don't, I probably shouldn't mention their names because that's probably a strike against them, but these are very much, you know, conservatives um, in, uh, you know, in anybody's book, but these are people who could get things done and work across the caucus. And it would be nice if you saw, you know, maybe, you know, some of these guys just say, okay, we got to have a serious person. If we can't, if the others can't get to 217, do we just say, you know, we, we got to, the world's on fire. We got to have somebody who knows how to hold the gavel up there. And those are two guys who've done it a lot in the chair. All right. Next. Um, will there be any consequences for the group of eight? Or Patrick McHenry, who's actually the yeah. speaker pro tem. There's another one <laughs> we haven't talked about. Any consequences for the group of eight? I suspect not. I don't think so either. I, you know, there were times when I was in the house, Boehner was speaker, and we, a small group of us, pleaded with him to uh, to use his authority and power to issue out consequences, and he refused to do it. I just don't see that happen. Not right. from the yeah. inside, but on the outside, I think there's actually already some ads being run against uh, Matt Gates in Florida. So consequences will be he won't be governor of Florida. So that's his whole ambition. He's never going to get a TV show on Fox. So there you go. Um, Nancy Mace could very well lose her race in South Carolina. I don't think she's going to be getting the support uh, she needs to get. Um, I think some of these others could get primaried and not because of anything um, anybody in Congress does, but just because people are going to look at them and say, you know what? They haven't passed legislation. They haven't done anything serious. And there's going to be some other people back home, maybe a state legislator in my state of Virginia, Bob Good, who is just a useless do nothing and say, we've got a bunch of people in Virginia, but in the state legislature, who have actually passed bills and are conservative, probably have even supported Donald Trump, who say, you know, I can do a lot more than that dope. And I think I would like to run. And I probably can find some people who don't think he's too hot who want to support me. And he doesn't have much money in the bank and he's probably not going to be getting any now. So he's had his 15 minutes and it's probably going to be pretty easy. So I would encourage people to look at any of those because their time is up and it's not going to be too hard. If you, if you want to work harder than them, it's not too hard. They're most of them are kind of lazy. So we don't want to stay overstay our welcome here, but two final questions um, for you. Um, the House has to get business done. Um, you know, uh, can can they get any business done with a speaker pro tem or a temporary speaker? Can you know what business can they get done, even with the gang of eight comp comprising a critical group to be able to reach the majority? Uh, can they get business done? Um, will there be time to get appropriations bills done or, you know, any tax extenders or any other things? Will there be too much chaos or will they say, OK, we're going to roll up our sleeves once we find somebody for speaker and are they able to get stuff done? Well, I think in the next couple of days, uh, it's unlikely that uh, uh, the rules can be modified to give 
McHenry the authority to do anything. So I, I don't think the Democrats will cooperate and uh, f because they're probably benefiting from our uh, the Republicans being on full display. Um, and then as far as the next 38 days, keeping the government open, I don't have high hopes that uh, uh, unless they find a speaker like Tom Cole or someone uh, more reasonable, uh, I think uh, Scalise, if, even if he's a speaker, he'll be under tremendous pressure by the gang of eight, unless they also modify the motion to vacate the chair rule. I agree with all of that. Okay. okay. Um, so a final question. Um, I like to quote Yogi Berra, who says, I never make predictions, especially about the future. Um, but uh, what do you predict? Who, if you had to say, w will this be resolved soon? W who will be the likely speaker? Or if you don't want to name a name, what will be the temperament of the likely uh, incoming speaker? Uh, and will the Republican Party be able to heal enough of its wounds to become more of a governing party, or at least to be able to work in a bipartisan manner with the Democrats to address the nation's problems? Anyone? Well, I think, I think you're uh, on, on the Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. I think I think Jordan has to be considered kind of the leader in the clubhouse at the moment, but I agree with Barbara. I don't see him getting to 217. So if I had to pick someone, I would think that Scalise uh, would, would have the respect uh, of the conference and be given the opportunity to serve as speaker. And then to your point, whether this is going to result in uh, the Republican Party and the, and the House members curing the, their dysfunction, I think that's unlikely. And I think you'll see more of the same. Charles? It's possible they could settle upon Scalise, but I think uh, I think more likely it'll be somebody like Patrick McCar uh, McHenry or or Tom Cole. And you think that uh, they'll be able to get to the? That's we say two seventeen now because there are vacancies, but the you know the two seventeen two eighteen number. Do you think? I think Tom it's possible Cole? one of the one of them could uh, get to that point, but. It's going to take a while, and the situation is going to have to get a lot worse before the before the conference will settle upon on somebody like that. Barbara, well, certainly between uh, Scalise and uh, Jordan, I think Scalise is you know far and away um, the better choice, and certainly hope that would be. But I don't know that either of them can get that. So if it starts going into others, you know, I mean, Patrick McHenry is, you know, possession could be nine tenths of the law, that might be um, where it might go, or somebody in that, you know, that, that governing wing, you know, Patrick McHenry, Tom Cole, a Steve Womack, um, that could, you know, that, that could be uh, a, you know, if they could wake up to something like that, that could be a nice um, outcome. Uh, if, it, but I think that would need to be some of the governing wing. And that, that's not even moderates. That's the governing wing just saying we're sick of being held hostage by the know-nothings, by these not serious people. And, you know, because some of these guys who, you know, they can also say, you know, if we retire, if we leave, you know, some of these seats, we could just walk out the door and throw, you know, because some of these guys, if they did walk out the door, and the seats were gone and they weren't put put in play, they could throw this into the minority. I mean, a lot of things could could happen. I mean, if Kevin McCarthy decides to leave, that's, you know, it's not like Gavin Newsom's gonna come to the rescue and, and give the seat uh, anytime soon. So there's a lot of things that could be threatened by the governing majority of that caucus if they decided to assert their majority that they do have. So I would hope they would use it wisely in that way in this time of crisis to say we've we've got to um, you know show the American people that we can govern if we want to come back to the majority again. And then the other wild card I'll throw in there if this drags on for too long is you're going to have Virginia elections in early November and they are very 50-50. And if for any reason, you know, and, and we certainly in Virginia are very concerned that this nonsense going on in Washington can spill over because it does, because in 2013, that election certainly did impact. And 
Um, Terry McAuliffe was very happy how it helped get him elected governor. So if that does hurt the Virginia elections, that could, again, have an impact and maybe tune some people up if they continue to drag this out that long, which I certainly hope they don't. So I guess what I'm hearing from uh, all of you is, uh, is a, a desire to sort of take the party by its lapels and say, wake up, wake up, and a hope that that him. can happen. Yeah, <laughs> um, A sense of despair that it might not happen and a sense of resignation that it's go along and get along and see what happens and go with whatever choices you have and just maybe, just maybe, uh, the dysfunction won't be as bad as it's been. Um, so uh, ultimately, what all three of you are saying is that uh, the Republican Party in the House and nationwide has a choice to make. Uh, and what choice it makes will impact our, the party, the House, uh, the Congress as a whole, 2024, and the nation at large and our ability to get things done. So a lot's riding on the Republican Party. And insofar as this speaker election is sort of a microcosm of all the dynamics and flows and currents that are roiling the, the party, um, uh, basically, uh, that's the state of America right now. So, and, and you know, one of the things one of the things we're saying on the foreign policy front, which you're going to hear from a lot of guys, is stand up to the bullies, right? That's what we're. I mean, stand up to the terrorists, stand up to the bullies. That's what we're saying in Israel. Certainly, that's what we're saying in Ukraine. You know, on the border, we want to stand up and do the right thing. Well, stand up to the bullies in our own party. You know, here they're afraid to stand up to Trump. They're afraid to stand up to the eight. They're afraid to stand up to whoever might run against them in a primary. Well, stand up for God's sake. You know, I mean, if you can't stand, you know, you got to stand up to Putin. You got to stand up to, you know, Hamas. And you got to stand up in your own, you know, in your own district. And you got to stand up for your people. And so, you know, this is the consistent thing. You've got to stand up to bullies. And that's what the American people are expecting of you. And it's not that hard. It really isn't. You know, I mean, you know, this is kind of the problem is that appeasement is what has gotten us here, you know, certainly in the House, you know, Kevin appeased these eight and it's not been good. You know, you got to face them down or you're going to keep it's going to keep growing this cancer. I mean, Matt Gates is, a, you know, th these this problem is a cancer on the party. And there's a lot of good people there that are sick of this. And you've that's what you're seeing are frustrated members. There's a lot of good legislators in there that you don't see because they're the ones who are trying to govern and they get overwhelmed. And all you see are the guys on TV who are the, the bad guys. So you know, they Professor, do the work, but don't get the headlines. Yeah. Professor, maybe Dave. in an effort to, to end on an optimistic note, uh, I, I think it was a, a Churchill quote where he, he said, uh, America always gets it right after they've tried everything else. So we're just working our way through some scenarios here and we'll, we'll get it right in the end. So. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of people in that caucus who can get it right and they do get it right and you never hear about their bills and all the things they're doing. And I would just like to see more of those people get the credit for all the good things they're doing. And that's why it'd be nice to see those people. Dave, we're putting that Churchill ad admonition to test. <laughs> so, I agree. We'll see. All right. Well, uh, I guess it's appropriate in this, uh, maybe not a civil war, but uh, uh, to, to quote Winston Churchill, but uh, uh, he he was a wartime leader and, and using Barbara's metaphor, uh, maybe he's the right one to close on. So look, thank you all so much for your insights, observations, uh, perspective, uh, thoughts. Uh, uh, you know, you all have your ears to the ground and you're hearing things. And I think what you're hearing is a great deal of frustration and a desire for hope. And I think that may sum it all up. So everyone, thank you for joining, for participating, for asking some very good questions that helped us move the conversation along. Uh, and uh, all I can say is what we say in the media, Stay tuned.